So, welcome back to Tales Tomorrow. I am Maro, your storyteller for the day, and with me I have some RPG horror stories to cover. By the way, I've been getting a lot of comments regarding how many of y'all are playing tieflings out there, and I gotta be honest, it's been making me feel very good to know that I'm not the only tiefling out there, and apparently tieflings are popular, but uh, they're just not in my area. There are no tieflings in my area, and that is really upsetting. Anyway, sorry, I'm just blabbering. Let's get to the RPG horror stories. The Cleric with the Main Character Syndrome This post was created with a third-party app, Joey. Some snippets of things, as Cleric said, did in a home game long ago. Cleric to the Warlock You can't cast Hypnotic Pattern, because I'm gonna cast Spirit Guardian, also Cleric. So that rundown can't be found last session. I made a spreadsheet at city planning between sessions. This is what we're going to do with the keep. This is what I'm going to cast. This is what each of you will be given up. No, none of you have a choice in the matter. I already worked it out with the GM. The party. We say the traitor should be executed or imprisoned. Cleric. No, the traitor will work for us as redemption. Party. We don't trust him. We're not comfortable with this. Cleric. We'll get over it because it happened. GM. I think it's a good idea. So we're kind of reading fragments of things and it's a lot of just kind of quotes. I'm having a difficult time understanding the actual context for it. It would be great with the writer what to like add a little more context on how these quotes happen because out of context, anything can be misconstrued as a problem, right? And it looks like the cleric is indeed having a problem, but maybe the problem player is not the cleric in the first place at all. Maybe there is no problem player. Maybe the when the DM says, I think it's a good idea to uh, retain a specific bad guy, you know, keep him close as like a... I guess as an assistant of some kind, right? You, you ever heard of the saying like, you know, keep your friends close but your enemies closer? Maybe keeping a watch on uh, like a, a, an antagonist of some kind in the story might be a good thing. And DM is like, yeah, that'd be really good because DM secretly wants it to, you know, play out more storytelling wise. But I don't know, reading fragments so far is a little difficult. Apparently there's a little bit of cheating, but uh, let's let's keep on reading on forward. The party is solving a puzzle for a possible loot or something we need later. The cleric doesn't like this puzzle. They run ahead and get into some trouble. The party doesn't go with them. GM pulls all the punches and we still get dragged into the fight. A cheating. Cleric always quickly solves any in-world lore puzzle and always knows every homebrew history. Turns out they were getting this information from the GM between sessions. Ah, I see. So it's a player empowered by the GM, I'm assuming so. It's a little difficult to get the context, but if the context from this current thing is true, then it seems like the GM is empowering the problem player by enabling their actions. Assuming all the other stuff is true, like regarding getting stuff spread out through like a spreadsheet and DM clearing it beforehand, maybe, yeah, that might be what's going on. I think the player is just power gaming and the DM is just a big enabler of the cleric. Because if they're supporting their decision and stuff, I mean, it could be. I don't know. There's a lot of context that is missing. We're reading fragments of a story, so I wish I could know a little more what happened, like, you know, a more detail. Cheating continued. Two months after the game concluded, the GM broke up with a significant other and moved in with Cleric. Fallout. GM and Cleric's relationship epically melts down a year or so later. Ah, the DM was thirsty. I see. I've heard stories of like DMs giving special treatment to certain players for maybe flirtatious reasons. Listen, it's fine if you have an attraction to like one of the players at the table, but while you are a DM, Regardless of whether you're in a relationship with somebody or not, you have to be very fair. Because you're not running the game for your significant other, you're running for everybody at the table. Whether your significant other there or not, or somebody that you may be attracted to, you still gotta be fair DM and play the role of DM very fairly. Not give people special treatment or approve things ahead of time and stuff like that. That's a good way to piss off the rest of the table. Either way, enabling any sort of play and focusing on one player as attention compared to the rest of the party and everybody else together in unison, that's a good recipe for a disaster. I wish I could know more context though because I'm very confused. The fragments give us very little. Oh, P. If at any point you decide to fill in more of the story, I would love to read more. Let's get to more clerics doing, well, bad stuff. The cleric that refused to understand boundaries. Let's get the preamble out of the way first. I am autistic with a DID and CPTSD, and some of my mental health gets in the way more than once in a story, whether it's recalling it or how I behave in the moment. 
trigger warnings, sexual assault, in-game drug use, targeted harassment, disregarding consent, and me being a dumbass DM for too long. This story goes through two campaigns and will be told as close to chronological order as I remember, as it happened between three years to about two months ago. And a large part of my formatting is to make it easy to read and easy for me to edit. It's also being copied from Google Doc, so sorry if that messes with anything. Honestly, I can appreciate people that have gone through and proofread this stuff to make it easy to read. Thank you. Thank you. Not to bash at any other writers, but I've read some stories that have been had a bit of a skewed flow to how they're writing, so thank you for taking the extra attention to make it easy to read. Cast in question. Me as a DM, fighter, cleric, paladin, eldritch, and three or four other players with lesser roles as wizard, warlock, wife, and sorcerer. But those who read my first RPG horror story might remember that I was close to giving up on TTRPGs at all. First campaign ended when the DM died, then my first RPG horror story happened and I had two games and two scheduling issues and another due to a dumb argument. Running a game through Roll20 in Discord was supposed to be my last attempt to play before I sold my books and dice. I just didn't want to keep being disappointed and blaming myself. This game was Curse of Strahd and I streamed it. Well, uh, most of it. Some days I wasn't feeling up to it, some days the internet gods just said no. Everyone involved gave the green light to do so, and I always announced when it went live. I bring this up partially as a reminder to myself that my mistakes still remain where people can find them, and they will remain an ever-present reminder to always be better. Everybody's gonna make mistakes regardless of what you do, whether in D&D or other things. The most important part about any mistake that happens is what you do with the mistake. If you learn from it to become better and know what to look out for, that's good. If somebody who keeps repeating mistakes like a lot of the problem players do, that's not good. But I give you a lot of respect already for uh, being self-aware of anything going on and to learning through mistakes. Listen, we all gonna mess up. We all screw up. I screw up. Everybody screws up. What you do with it, that's what matters the most. Anyway, let's get back to the story. The game started fairly smoothly with the Death House, and the first lesson I learned was the horror of D&D Wiki. The fighter wanted to dip into a Madoka Magical Style Magical Girl class which gave his 1d12 Maul 1d6 of Radiant, Necrotic, and Fire Damage each. Never again trusting that site, but it was my bed to lay in. Madoka Magical Girl? I mean, listen, I've heard of homebrew that is more, way more balanced than that. If you get a d6 of what? Radiant, Necrotic, and Fire? That's wild. I am pretty sure Blaine Simple is making like PDFs of like D and D five E, but anime that I hear is way more balanced. So, yeah, it happens, I guess. I interesting homebrew there. The party continued, and I was hopeful that this would be success. The windmill resulted in one if the hag being thrown out of a window, and WWE style elbow dropped in. The first meeting with Strahd was fairly seamless, and the party seemed very involved. Paladin dropped out for a while after some IRL issues, and I recruited Cleric to maintain the four active players, which started to repeat issues and the meat of this story. At one point, Fighter got infected with lycanthropy and needed someone to cast or remove curse on him. Cleric offered, but only if Fighter took part in a ritual. I thought it was a cool idea since I was unfamiliar with this spell and thought it might add something to this stream. It unfortunately added my biggest mistake as a DM. Ever. Cleric had forcefully removed Fighter's clothes and started humiliating him through insults and assaults. I myself as am a victim of SA and this left me shocked. I was dumb enough to not immediately shut it down and retcon it and opted to push through hoping it would be over soon. Even made a couple of jokes to try to downplay it. Okay, so I'm not gonna say too much, but I've had experience with things going awkward on a stream no less, and it's such a difficult position to get to, where something really awkward is happening, you just wanna just get it over with and move on to the next thing, that is, the yeah, was put on the spot. You know what's even more appalling? That's not even how this spell works, I have removed curse, and if you know warlocks, warlocks don't exactly have the biggest open variety to spells that they can grab, and sometimes if you grab a wrong spell, it could just be like, oh now you have the spell you'll probably never use that again except for one thing maybe two things i have removed curse you know what you do you just go remove curse 
Done. Ritual flavor sounds cool, but I mean, not if you gotta strip somebody naked. I should've kicked Cleric right there and cancelled the session. Yeah, you probably should've, but I didn't. I was still dealing with my first D&D group blaming me for the DM's death. He was hit by a truck driver on a way to meet me one day and the blame stuck. Still does today. Sorry, no good place to put that bit. Oh my god, that's horrifying! Wait, the other players blame you for it? What? That's insane! That's actually absolutely freaking insane! Hey, listen, car accidents happen, vehicle accidents on the road happen, it's dangerous to drive on a road sometimes, and anything can happen, that's what they're called accidents. They're not meant to happen, but they just happen. But you shouldn't be taking the blame for that, that sounds horrible. And it's so shitty of the other players to blame me for that. What the fuck is wrong with them? What the fuck is wrong with them? I know I kinda freaked out there, but like, that's... that's to live with the guilt of that and have other players remind you saying that clearly what's not your fault is your fault that's i'm i'm sorry that's terrible what the fuck are the other players doing doing that what the hell listen life is unfair and bad things happen in life but doesn't mean everything is like your fault jesus christ what is wrong with the other players We'll play it on, and Cleric would make Fighter her personal punching bag for the rest of the campaign, even after Fighter's character died and was replaced. Even when Fighter left the game, and I, with Fighter's permission, used his new character to balance combat. Cleric would go on to bring up the ritual a few more times before I put my foot down and implemented my current red light green light system to change topics. Cleric would also start every game with asking, so we killing Strat today? Or insists that she wanted to summon the Tarask every single session, even though I'd ask her every session to nod, unless she was going to commit to trying to kill Strat at level 5 or 6. This wouldn't be too bad, except the campaign went on for almost 40 sessions, and those two jokes started at session 9. I'm glad you find it funny, but if everybody else doesn't find it funny at the table, you probably should stop or get new material. Listen, I say a lot of dumb things, but at least my dumb things have a bit of variety. Imagine if I started every single video with the same joke over and over. That'd probably get annoying in everyone's terms, and even me. That'd get annoying for everyone, including myself. I would hate myself. She would later gain the spell Control Water and try to use it in the most clunky and complicated ways, including trying to control monsters by casting the spell on the water in their bodies, even if I said no. This issue alone happened close to 10 to 20 minutes. I know the body is made, you know, like a, out of like 75 or 80 percent water, but doesn't mean you can control people. What's the point of having dominate mind or dominate creature? That kind of takes over the whole point of other charm spells that control targets specifically. Water is just, you know, water puddles buckets of water water in a cup you can't control body inside someone's you can't you can't control water inside someone's body that'd be busted i end up venting about her trying to overrule me to a few of my more experienced friends and i really should have listened and kicked her then but i didn't she continued through the entirety of curse of strad and into dungeons of drakenheim Beckenheim re-adds Paladin, now playing as a druid, and introduces another cleric. We'll call him Eldridge, since that was his domain. And this was Eldridge's first TTRPG ever. Slight edit. I've tried to rehearse this a few times to check for errors for this point on. If I say fighter, I mean Paladin. I haven't talked to the fighter for over a year at this point. The campaign was going fairly smoothly, with exploration being a key early on for the party to make money by selling a crystal called Delirium. This crystal is basically magical uranium with harmful Lovecraftian radiation, but is highly sought after for its use in magic and unique octarine color. Clerics seem to target Paladin once the Healbot Grave Cleric made a comment about giving Paladin's undead character funeral rites. Cleric used that interaction to repeatedly ask to bury Paladin's character and make comments about leaving Paladin to die. At around this point, I had seen some D&D channels talk about how this type of disruptive behavior can be linked to the player not having fun, and I messaged Cleric to see if she had any issue with the game. She said she was having fun and said she enjoyed the character when I asked if playing a rogue in this campaign was an issue. It made me feel like the issue isn't with the game as much as it is with the person or people, and that wasn't my strong suit of understanding. So I turned towards people who knew Cleric for a long time. Friends, former players, people who have interacted with her online, etc. And a few close friends of my own. Apparently this disruptive behavior was very common regardless of setting or game. Or who the players were. One game cleric had threatened to cause an avalanche which would TPK 
even after being given multiple chances not to and told explicitly what would happen. She ended up attacking a PC who was talking her down. In others, she would cause drama and either leave or keep trying to fix the issue regardless of if someone put boundaries in place. She blamed this on being autistic or just not understanding, but more than once she had given clear instructions and would confirm she understood, but do it again. She had to go, but I wasn't sure how to do it. I wanted to word it right and feel like I might have been unfair. I know I wasn't now, but brains are a-holes. Eldridge had joined at this point, and his ongoing joke was liking to smoke weed as a hobby. I used this a few times to explain why he had failed a skill check, or just to make a joke in roleplay. Cleric used this to try to get Eldridge to try poisons and dangerous alchemical things, but telling him it was a drug almost twice a session. Eldridge would decline every time, and even say that he doesn't trust Cleric, so why would he take it? You know, good on Eldridge. Good on Eldridge to seeing that the other Cleric was being a little bit, uh, extra and everything. Here's the worst part as well. You know, I know people like this, and everybody knows that there's some sort of, like, a, a disruptive person within the group. Like, they seem fine, but they constantly have the same behavior, same repeated offense behavior of being disruptive. That probably was a red flag to basically be like, hey, okay, this person is being very disruptive, people have said they're being disruptive, they have a very similar habit of being disruptive continuously. Probably not a good fit for my game. Uh, but I mean, you know, we, we know the, the cleric stayed in the game, and we know the OP, you know, learned the lesson from that. So, let's see how it crashes and burns, I guess. At one point, I let Cleric and Paladin forage for stuff to make use of our alchemy system. I gave Cleric Poppy and Nightshade, hoping she'd use it to make a tranquilizer and damage poisons. She took both of them and Delirium, rolled them into a joint, and tried to convince Eldritch to smoke it. When he finally got fed up with this going on for almost two minutes, he told her to f*** off. I told her stop harassing Eldritch with her bad joke, and she promptly tried to get Paladin to smoke it, and then the rest of the party and then returned to Eldritch with it. I had a talk over her to get the game moving again. Her disruptions were so bad and frequent that our usually more quiet sorcerer lashed out and told Cleric to stop trying to overrule a failed save, which I assured only had roleplay consequences. If your quietest player is lashing out at the problem player, that's a huge sign that something is wrong. Quiet people, especially quiet players, right? They're very polite, or maybe they don't want to interact, or maybe they're a little bit shy, but if actual aggravation gets past a shy player, that they lash out at the problem player, that's a huge red flag, massive red flag. I appreciate the uh, sorcerer for saying something at least, because it needed to be said. Maybe a week or so later, I talked to Paladin and Eldridge on how they felt, and both felt like their enjoyment was being affected. Eldridge said he was looking forward to the games less each time because of Cleric's actions. This was her last chance, and I made multiple plans on how to reasonably remove Cleric from the game, but none ended up being needed. She started more arguments in the Discord, and Sorcerer became aware of the sexual assault incident in Curse of Strahd. I sent Sorcerer the VOD and the timestamp, and Sorcerer kicked Cleric from the Discord. Good! Thank you, Sorcerer! Wow! I can't believe the Sorcerer came out on top! Good for you, Sorcerer! Thank you! Thank you, Sorcerer! We were worried a bit about how Cleric would react, because the last time she was kicked from a Discord, she had basically burned those bridges by trying to go into someone's DMs trying to fix the issue, even if she was asking nicely, then told, and then yelled at, to leave the person alone. You know how you fix up with a problem player? You block them from anything and just ignore them at this point. If they decide to go to your friends or whatever, and your friends like have questions, you just explain to them, yeah, we kicked them because they're being toxic as hell. And you got VODs to prove that. Clip all the VODs and just send it to people and be like, yeah, there we go. This is Cleric's action here, Cleric's action there. Oh yeah, sexual assault, here you go. That's what Cleric did. And eventually we decided we just don't want to have to deal with that anymore. Easy, simple, beautiful cover girl. I don't know where that came from, just it went, it went with the flow. She ended up messaging me a couple of months later, trying to say she enjoyed the game and she was sorry for her actions, but I ignored the message and deleted it. I gave her too many chances, I was apparently not the only one, or even the first 10 to tell her to fix her behavior issues. The first 10, ugh, yikes. I don't wish her any harm, and I do hope she finds a group that actually suits her and her personality but I don't want her anywhere near me or my games. I'm just tired of giving bad actors too many chances. And again, I unfortunately had one last bad actor that I trusted for too long, but this post is already long enough. 
As for my game now, Drakenheim is still going. The party had made a lot of progress in the game. My new dog seemed to be the biggest disruption in the games now, but she seems to have become the mascot of the games. Lesson learned. Put your foot down. No means no. Kick the problem sooner than three years down the line and always learn from every session and mistake. I don't think I'll ever delete the curse of Stradbods. They serve as a good reminder of the dumbest things I've ever allowed on my table and the things I will never allow again. I'm sorry to my players, and I promise to always keep improving. That last sentence is everything that is wonderful about this OP. Learning from mistakes, and learning to find ways to keep improving, and focusing on the player's enjoyment as well as their own. Don't forget, DM, your enjoyment of the game is also very important, and removing a problem player is probably going to be a good thing for you and the rest of your players, but also for yourself as well. Your enjoyment is equally as important as your player's enjoyment of the campaign and of any games that you'll run. And the last sentence here just puts a smile on my face. I am so happy that things worked out. Took a while, but it worked out. I'm hoping the games are going well OP and I'm wishing you the best times with your current player base. Also, if you have that other story about the other problem player, let me know. Seriously, I would love to read it. And with that, that's gonna be all our stories for today. I wanna thank you very much for watching and thank you so much for being here. If you like what I do, consider subscribing to the channel and leaving a like. Also, if the RPG horror stories ever goes down or if you wanna submit your own personalized horror story, email is down in the description below. I'll see you again in more Tales tomorrow. Bye-bye.